Charla, thank you so much for joining me here on the Homeschool Sanity Show. I am excited to jump into our topic of real life personal finance today. But before we do that, I would love to have you tell us more about you and your family. Yeah, so I am a wife, a mom. I've got two kids. My son is 21 years old. He is studying aerospace engineering at Purdue. And my daughter is 16 years old. She is a junior in high school. She goes to a uh, private school here in the area, Grace Christian School. Um, And my husband works from home and travels a bunch. And I am a retired CPA um, (laughs) and homeschool mom. So I I run my business, basically, is, is what I do while everybody else is out living their lives. Well, I can relate to some of that for sure. Um, I ask all of my guests who have homeschooled why they decided to homeschool originally. I find it so fascinating. So I would love to have you share that. Yeah, well, you know, I always, I, I just, I grew up, I'm, I'm an only child. And so I um, I was a teacher to my stuffed animals. I would line them all up and, you know, um, <laughs> have them do their work. And I've always loved teaching. I really feel like that is my uh, passion. And when my son was in a local elementary school here in, a, in public school, it was a fine school and it was small. And what I loved is the diversity of the, the different kids and their backgrounds and stuff. But there was just stuff my son wasn't learning that I knew he should. And so, I mean, he would come home and I would give him homework. I mean, you know, I... I just kind of always was homeschooling him, even while he was in school. And then I knew kind of the rubber was going to meet the road in middle school, those kind of transition years where there was just stuff I wanted him to learn. And so I I knew this was my opportunity. So I pulled him out in middle school and just sat him down. And and that's where this curriculum came from is, is those years, because one of the things I really wanted him to learn is about money and how it's a tool and how to use it, how to think of it, how to leverage it for, you know, whatever goals you have. And so I really loved those homeschooling years because I've got the freedom to teach just exactly what he needed to learn. So that's what I did. Um, and it was great. We loved it. We even took the third year um, and we just traveled the country because what better way to learn? We had an opportunity to do that. And and so I I loved every minute of it. Wow. I bet. Well, I could really relate when you were talking about lining up your stuffed animals to teach. I did that too. I mean, every night I held class (laughs) in my bedroom and I'm surprised that I didn't want to become a teacher um, because then when I had the opportunity to teach after I graduated um, with a degree in psychology, I got the chance to teach at a university and I absolutely loved it. And so then, of course, homeschooling was a perfect fit. I just didn't know it yet. It took a while. That's exactly what I, you know, I just sort of woke up one day, uh, a homeschool parent, you know, I didn't, (laughs) at the time, um, homeschooling wasn't as as big as it is now or Mm -hmm. I didn't I wasn't tapped into that world and so you know it's kind of I pulled back the curtain and I was like oh look at all you guys wow you know I just I didn't know you know I remember going to my first homeschool convention like wow wow Mm -hmm. it's amazing that it is so you are a CPA and I imagine having having a son who is majoring in finance that you had an interest in money management before you got your degree, but what specifically really kind of lit a fire of interest in personal finance for you? You know, listen, I'm just going to be really, really transparent here. Okay. (laughs) I love to spend money and (laughs) I love to go. I love to travel and I love to eat. And what I figured out pretty early on, my mom, uh, I was raised, I'm an only child. 
I never lived in a house. It was always apartments. My mom mm -hmm. was, for all intents and purposes, a single mom. Um, we did not have very much money at all, ever. Um, I remember I've, I've been working since I was 15. Um, and I always, you know, I always just knew I wanted that pair of guest jeans when I was young. And my mother, there was no way. There was just no way. And so I went out and I was like, oh, well, I'm about to get a job so I can buy those guest jeans. And so really it was trying to figure out I'm two things like I am a spender, but I'm also a planner. And I really the marriage of those two things, which is like, OK, here's here's my hopes and dreams and here are my resources. And how do I take these to get to there? And, and how do I take these? And, and really just filter it through because, you know, and this is one of my soapboxes for kids. Of course they want to do everything because they don't have to pay for anything. So <laughs> of course they want, you know, it's the same thing like with their extracurriculars, you know, mm -hmm. because it costs them nothing. They just get driven to the place and they get to, you know, hang out with friends and it costs them nothing. Of course they want to do it. And so... Mm -hmm. Sometimes just having money really helps you understand what your values are and what you're willing to work for and what doesn't matter after all. So it's really, I remember I, I have a degree in finance, um, but I didn't really like the finance part. I love the accounting. Um, I love doing taxes, which is kind of weird, I guess, but, <laughs> but I, I love just helping people are talking to people. I'm very interested in how they're leveraging money to meet their goals. Mm -hmm. That that's really neat. Um, can't relate to loving to do taxes or loving accounting. <laughs> no, I at guess all. Not. Just going to be honest. Uh, I can't fair. relate to that. It's entirely but what, fair. <laughs> but what I think I can relate to is that you found that there was something missing in personal finance curriculum for teens when you were teaching your own kids about money. And can you tell us more about that, the thing that led you to want to develop your own curriculum? <laughs> yeah, yes, I accidentally, I stumbled into that as well. Uh, so, you know, in seventh grade was my year that I was going to teach my son about money. and. I very much believe in the, the way you teach is by having them do something. You know, if I wanted him to learn piano, I wouldn't just lecture him about a piano. I wouldn't give him a book about piano or have a video. I would literally put him in front of a piano and, you know, and so the same thing is true with money. So that's seventh grade year. Not only were we going to learn about money, but I was going to very intentionally give him money for the purposes of him practicing using money. Um, and I can talk about that in just a little bit. But one of the things is, you know, money more than anything is what he's going to have to deal with for his entire adult life. So I really wanted him to take seriously. So I bought the curriculum that uh, pretty much a lot of people do. And I played the videos and I'm over there and I'm like, ah, this is great. You know, oh, this is great. This is good information. Yes. <laughs> and my son is over there and he's just, he's really sweet. Okay. So all my stories, he sounds a little bit snarky, uh, but <laughs> he has a good heart. <laughs> and so he's over there and he's like, this is really great. And I'm sure this guy is really good guy, but mom, a $5,000 car please. I'm going to be, rich. you know, like I'm like, I'm going to be mm -hmm. rich. Like I'm going to be an engineer and they're going to pay me like $60,000 every single year. Like why would I just only spend 5,000 on a car? Like he just, and in that moment, I knew what the problem was mm. for adults the personal finance curriculum out there is really good because we mm -hmm. are in a financial desert. And when someone hands us the, uh, a cool glass of water, which is the advice of how to get ourselves out of the problem, we just drink it up. Oh yes, this is good. This is great. Oh, you're right. This is how you save money. This is the coupons. This is the snowball effect. This is, you know, but if you're a teenager, you don't even know you're in trouble. 
you don't think you will be in trouble. You, uh, you know, so it's not like, it's not even that they're arguing that uh, you should have a high interest rate. They're not arguing with the information. They just don't think it's relevant to them. And so in that moment, I knew that my job as his mom and teacher was to show him that it is relevant to him. And I can't do it with just the allowance that he was getting, because if you go from giving a kid 20 bucks a week to them making $60,000 a year, they are going to feel rich, but they're not rich at all because <laughs> there's so much that has to be saved for. And there's so much, but they're going to feel rich and they're going to spend as if they are rich. Because the truth is, even if they give away 10% and save 20%, that's still 70% of $60,000 that they can just blow. I mean, it's no wonder they have a boat and, you know, just like a yeah, fancy cars or, or cool stuff. So I wanted to show him. So I wrote this curriculum on just a yellow sheet of paper that is basically taking him 20 years of his life. I'm like, okay, Jack, let's pretend you're 22 years old. Let's look at how much an engineer actually gets paid not just what you heard or what you want, but actually gets paid. And then the next 20 lessons, I took him, we learned about cars, apartments. I made him get married. We had kids, you know, all the things. I made him go through his life in 20 lessons from 22 to 42, spending that money and understanding, oh, hold up. If I spend too much on a car, I don't have enough for a honeymoon. Or if I spend too much here, I don't have enough here. Oh, wait a minute. And then he really begins to see because he's experiencing it. One of the um, financial curriculums out there um, it encourages you to share your family's financials with the kid so that they can really see how it works. But the problem mm -hmm. is, I don't, I mean, maybe it works for some kids, but I just have, I have kids that wouldn't handle that well. They mm -hmm. would either brag because they thought it was a lot of money. Oh, my parents make this much money. Mm -hmm. Or they would be ju super judgy. Oh, uh, we can't, mm -hmm. you, you, you can't spend your money on that. Why are we buying that? Why are we doing that? You know, like what? <laughs> no, no. So at the time I had that curriculum. I, had a, I bought several financial curriculums and none of the, you know, I felt like Goldilocks, like it's too hot, too cold, too boring, too whatever. And, but I did just kind of pluck things out when I developed this. And one of them was, yeah, they have to see adult money, but instead of mm -hmm. seeing my adult money, I'm going to let them see theirs. And I'm going to challenge them with every decision they make. Oh, why'd you buy that car? Did you pay cash or did you not have enough for cash? So you had to have a loan. I even mm -hmm. let him have loans. I let him have student loans and car loans because to me, there's no better way for them to learn the pain of loans and paying more for something than you should than experiencing it, right? I mean, that's when I learned. Um, mm -hmm. And so I teach this class live now, you know, fast forward um, several years, I, I teach it live. And when my students get done paying off, because I make them have student loans for 10 years, if they choose a college they can't afford. <laughs> so halfway through the class, it's time to, you know, that their student loan is down to zero. And the, the relief, they're like, oh, thank goodness. I'm so glad. And I just know, now, of course, oh. you know, I, I rarely see those kids again, but I know mm -hmm. that when the time comes for them to decide student loan or not, they are way better informed because mm -hmm. they've already had one in their little fake budget. They go, oh yeah, now I, now I fully see what my choice is. And you know, I had to have student loans to go to college because my mom didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. But I, and so, you know, student loans may be necessary for some, but the problem is when you don't understand what you're getting, when you can't understand how much of your income goes towards that and, and the balance between those two, that's what my class is trying to teach so that they can make whatever decision they need to with their eyes open. Mm, that is so good. And I am mm -hmm. just relating to so much 
of what you're saying. And I, I absolutely love it. And I have a lot more questions. So <laughs> yes, what, uh, you know, I know that we're going to tell our listeners more about the curriculum that you have developed, but what are some practical ways that our teenagers can begin to practice real life finance when they're still living at home with us? So what are some initial steps that we can take as parents? Well, you know, the first thing I would recommend is just to get money in their hands for them to learn. And, and you know, allowance is such, there's a lot that goes into an allowance. There's a lot that we think of when it's in allowance. But if you kind of peel back the layers on that and realize that you don't have to do an allowance from the time they're three till the time they're 18. You know, you can treat it like a class. That's the beauty of homeschool. You have the freedom to treat it like a class. You can say, hey, here's the deal. This year for this semester, I'm going to give you an allowance and here's what we're going to do. And then you can take a break and then you can say, okay, a couple of years later, you're growing up. I'm going to give you more money and I'm going to have you practice doing different things. And what, but a lot of times we mess up because we tie an allowance to chores. And my daughter, who she is a saver. And uh, mm -hmm. so had I only had my daughter, this curriculum would not exist. My son and I are simpatico in our uh, money thoughts, but my daughter, she is notoriously cheap. So she, if I were to make her have an allowance and it's tied to chores, there is no dollar amount on earth that would get her to clean that potty. It just wouldn't happen. She would just be like, oh, no, I'm good. And all of a sudden, now you've kind of got a labor strike, you know, where it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm only cleaning if I need the money. So what I would suggest is give them an allowance. And it's it feels like free money. Like, well, they're not earning it. They're not doing anything. But it isn't because you're giving, it's like a soccer ball or a piano. You're giving them a tool and you're requiring mm -hmm. them to use it. So don't just give them money and let them do whatever. Give them money and tell them what it's to be spent on. From now on, like my son loves, to this day, he loves candy. So every time we went to the grocery store or to the gas station or wherever, it was always, can I get some candy? Can I get some candy? Can I get some candy? And it's, it's exhausting. And so I, when he was little, I said, okay, here you go. I'm going to give you money. And I'm not going to buy you candy anymore. If you want candy, you pay for it with this money. And the lessons there are so many, right? Because when he goes to the grocery store, I mean, and maybe I'm just a mean mom, but he goes to the grocery store and he goes, can I have some candy? And I go, yes. And he goes, great. I go, do you have your money? Oh, well, well, I don't have any money. Oh, well, then I guess you can't. Like, I let the money tell him no, because that's how it is in real life. Mm -hmm. I'm all the time telling him yes. Yes, you can have that if you have the money. And so he learned to bring his wallet. He learned that when you spend money here, then you don't have it for the next time. If you spend too much money too quick, it takes a long time to build that back up. And those lessons are so powerful. And if you do that when your kid is home, then it, will he mess up? Yes. Will he buy a big family size thing of Twizzlers and eat it all at one time and puke? Yes. But that lesson, learning how learning the excess hurts is something that we all have to learn and they they just don't learn it with our words. They learn it with, with action. So mm -hmm. when my son, I did, he candy. And then a little bit later, we, I ramped up the allowance and I said, okay, I'm not buying toys except for your birthday and Christmas. And he was huge into Legos. So, you know, it takes a long time to save up for Legos. So what I did is I quantified and this is the tricky part. You kind of have to decide how much you're already spending on your kid. If once every four trips you give them candy, 
then there's your number. Or if you buy a couple of Lego ships a year outside of Christmas and birthday, then there's your number. So I would say to Jack, those Lego ships are like a hundred bucks. So I oh. would say, hey, I'm going to give you an allowance that, and, and now I want you to save up for Legos. Now you can spend it on whatever you want, but I'm not going to, this is your Lego money. And I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to do, you know, 20 bucks a month and you have to buy candy and Legos. And now all of a sudden he's seeing with every candy bar he buys, he's further away from the Legos. And that's what I would do is, is that um, my son also loves to eat out. He was too cool for the kids menu. So when he got a little bit older, I gave him more allowance. Okay, buddy, I'm going to give you more money. And now you are going to pay when we go out to eat. Mm -hmm. And so you can eat off the kids menu and that will give you more money for the Legos. Or you can get that hand squeeze lemonade for $4 and you'll have less money for Legos. Does, does mm -hmm. that make sense? I would try to quantify what the kid wants. And then instead of buying it yourself, give it, give them the money in cash. And you'll be stunned at how often you really drive by Starbucks. They don't want that drink anymore. Why? Because they know that they get to keep that cash. And that's, those are the decisions that you and I make every single day. And we need to get them to practice it when the dollars are small and the mistakes are small. Otherwise, when they're in their 20s and they haven't learned that lesson, it's going to be a lot more waste. And now their credit score is impacted. Now, blah, you just don't want all that. Mm -hmm. And um, well, first of all, I am struck by the similarities between our 21-year-old sons. <laughs> when uh, my son, who's now 21, uh, when his older brother got a driver's license, he said, you're so lucky. You can go and drive and get candy anytime you want now. <laughs> That's right. I that's right. That was hilarious. That's that's the advantage of having a driver's license is to get candy. Right. Um, but I would I I'm just seeing so much wisdom in what you're saying. And our kids had jobs when they turned um, 15 or 16. Yes. Uh, depending on the the kid, and that also added to having an allowance and being paid for special responsibilities like mowing the lawn right. um, really helped them to make good decisions. And I was just going to say to our listeners that my college kids continue to operate that way. And so here is what I mean. We, we for example, just said, okay, we're going to go to a movie, but you guys are responsible for paying for your own tickets. That's right. And so we can go to a more expensive movie that has uh, the surround sound, um, or we can pay less and maybe go at a not as great of a time. What do you want to do? That's and right. it is, it's amazing how, you know, when my kids have had opportunities to go on ski trips with my husband, and if they have to pay for their lift ticket, um, maybe their plane ticket too. My husband usually handles the lodging, um, and the food, but you know, they will wrestle with it. Do I want to spend my money on this? And it's, it's just so good. And then one other thing, one other real benefit that I have seen of letting kids manage their own money and pay for their own, um, you know, hobbies and, and, uh, toys and games and that kind of thing is that, my kids would often work together to yes. make purchases. I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. I had no idea that they even wanted like a virtual reality headset, but they got together. We're talking about how much it would cost if they split it, who was going to split it. Yes. Uh, it's just a fantastic real life experience. I totally agree. I, I, I totally agree. And it also, it, it helps them with their gratitude because if you don't know the cost of something, and I don't even really just mean money, I mean of effort, of sacrifice, whatever. If you don't know the cost of something, then you really can't be grateful for something because you don't know what's been given up. 
But mm-hmm. I will tell you, my son loved, he would all the time have fresh squeezed lemonade on my nickel. And when I started making him pay for it, um, every now and then we'd go out to eat. And if he did particularly well with school or we were celebrating, he got a, you know, a new job or something, then I'd go, hey, buddy, did you get that fresh squeezed lemonade on your mom? And he would take me like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, mom. And he, instead mm-hmm. of just pounding it, he just, mm-hmm. little steps, you know, and it's just, it was my money all along. The money mm-hmm. I'm giving him mm-hmm. to pay for those things has always been my money. But when it gets in their hands, it, it's a mind shift that they just, they just have to have. Mm-hmm. And I also, you know, when they have a job, I have a lot of parents who their kids are under the impression that that money that they earn for their job is theirs. And that's just not true. What I say is you have a current self and you have a future self. And every dollar you get, whether it's from your grand, overly generous grandparents, whether it's from work, whatever it is, you need to give away 10%. Current you can keep 20% and future you needs 70% because future you needs way more money than current you does. So every dollar they get, every dollar. And, and, you know, for those that are like me that are spenders, I learned early on not to use the term savings with my son because he just didn't care Mm. because I was saving for a stranger that he didn't know. He knew himself and he knew current Jack wants those shoes. But when I try to say, hey, future Jack's going to need a car, he's like, that's future Jack's problem. You know, so I I never said savings. I always put it in those terms. Hey, Hmm. you are going to get to spend every single dollar. It's just not now. Mm -hmm. You just, there are things that you are going to need. You have hopes and dreams and goals and whatever those are, car, student loan, I mean, um, car, college, apartment, whatever it is, the future you is going to need much more. And just getting them changing that mindset is important as well, because it just feels like all my work and all I'm doing is saving it. No, you're spending it in the future. Don't worry. It's going to be great. It's going to be a great future. Mm -hmm you know. Okay. Oh, I really like that. And I know, you know, we can draw a parallel from that to also time management. Yes. <laughs> um, I've been thinking about that for myself. Um, but that's a whole other topic. But I, I love that the future you being yes. concerned about um, the future you. So I think this ties in really, really well with another question that I have for you, which is how should we respond when we think our teen is making a poor financial choice. And I can give you a very uh, personal example. My kids got an inheritance um, when a beloved family member passed. And some of my kids made the decision to invest in Bitcoin. And this was at a time that I knew next to nothing about it, but it seemed really, really scary (laughs) to me. Uh, Now, some of them were adults. Some of them were not. Some of them were still minors when they were doing this. And so what is the appropriate response? And, you know, on a, on a smaller level, when your son says, I'm going to buy $200 tennis shoes, Uh um, you know, do you say anything about it or, or not? Right. Well, so I will say that I'm filtering all this through the, um, through my model of making him put away 70% for the future. Okay. So if he has put 70% away for future Jack, then that leaves him with 20 to 30%, depending on, you know, how, how much you would, would want him to give away to our broken world to blow, to blow, to really burn, to really just (laughs) absolutely do whatever they need to do. Because, you know, my son, I'm glad you mentioned shoes because I've got stories for days. 
my son went and bought, you know, when I gave him money to buy his clothes. So, you know, the same kind of thing. I just put, I, I, I just made a little budget and said, hey, I'm willing for this school year to buy you two pairs of shoes to, you know, data, whatever it was. And then I said, and here is about how much I'm willing to spend for those items. I added it all up. I gave him the money in a gift card and said, here you go, buddy. This is for your clothes for the year. And of course I was with him because I, I did it when he was young enough that I, I was with him and he, you know, likes my advice and he went and he found $200 pairs of shoes. Now the problem was his budget you know, and it wasn't his budget, it was mine. But when I, the amount I gave him was a hundred dollars for each pair of shoes. So I was like, Hey bud, this is, you know, this is your whole budget in one pair of shoes. Yeah. Yeah. No, nah, mom, but you don't understand because you don't understand because what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to take good care of these and I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and I was like, okay, but I, I do need you to know that there will be no more shoes. Like, that's it. No, 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 no. I, I won't need any shoes because this one. Super. Super. That kid loved those shoes. He loved them so much that I looked out the window and saw him mowing the lawn in those shoes within a month of having them. And I'm telling you, my husband and I were losing our minds, losing it, watching out the window, just like, and, and, and my husband's like, I'm going out there. I'm, nope, don't you go out there. Don't do it. And I'm telling you, those green shoes, because they were now green, because they were white, um, he had to wear them for a year. And he, you know... If he ever complained about the shoes, which he's smart enough not to do because he knows what I'm going to say. But if he ever, if the, if the subject of shoes ever came up, I would, I would have said, well, you know, if you need some more shoes, you've got this other money. Like you can do other, you can do a special project. You can mow a neighbor's lawn. Like if you want, you can do something else. Or if you want, I can add that to your Christmas list. And instead of getting something else, you could get shoes. Like trying to show them mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what it's costing them to make that bad choice. But then letting them make that bad choice. And, you know, if your kid spends all their money on shoes and doesn't have sweaters and they are cold, that's okay. It's just okay. Like I live in North Carolina. I'm not talking any, any of any of the super northerners obviously have a different issue, but it's okay to let them suffer because it's suffering for the greater good. Um, it's, it's that lesson that is painful. You know, maybe they have to wear a coat that is short or maybe, oh, this is a good one. I, my son took our family Christmas pictures in those green shoes. And, <laughs> and to this day, that's one of my favorite pictures because I love the green shoes because mm -hmm. it just shows exactly where he was at that time. Mm -hmm. And that lesson, you know, he, the next time we did it, the next year, he, he will not buy shoes that are that expensive anymore. In fact, you know, he, $85 is about what he's willing to pay to this day as a 21 year old, he, it, because he would rather have two pair of shoes than just one expensive pair. He's learned the hard way, but it's hard. It's so hard, but you know, it's the mm -hmm. same thing. Like when they were little <laughs> and they were in their crib crying and after you change them and, you know, sometimes you just have to let them kind of cry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's hard on our mom's hearts, mm -hmm. but it's for, it's for, for the best. Mm -hmm. Right. I agree. And I will just say that um, even in colder climates, teenage boys are fine going without a coat. Right. 
Right. <laughs> My boys never wanted to wear a coat. Never they still don't. Yeah. Yeah, and they then, don't want to wear a coat. So they they're just, they're gonna spend on their priorities, right? Exactly. And that's what mm -hmm. they're going to do anyway. Mm -hmm. And so the sooner they learn what those priorities are, mm -hmm. then the the more wise they will be. The sooner right. they learn, hey, you know what? I actually don't need a coat. Mm -hmm. Great. Go for it. <laughs> Well, you this, know, this is so my son would buy, if I made him, mm -hmm. I would say, Hey buddy, you need to have a coat. Well, I'm not buying a coat. Okay. Well then I'll buy a coat for you. He mm -hmm. would let me buy him a coat and he would want a fancy one. And I would buy that right. coat and it would sit in the closet <laughs> or he would promptly lose it. That's mm -hmm. a whole other thing. If they lose the shoes, if they lose the coat, if they lose the water bottle, whatever it is that they broke or they lost, they mm -hmm. have to pay for. Mm -hmm. And that is rough. Right. It's rough. But that's what that 70% is. Mm -hmm. It's like, hey, you've got an emergency fund, mm -hmm. you know? So. Mm -hmm. Very good. But they won't learn it. Right. Well, that is just excellent. And I am hoping now that you have given us some ideas of how we could start to teach our kids real life money management on our own. What can homeschoolers who enroll in your course that you've developed, what can they expect from that? Yeah. So it's 20 lessons. Um, it's all self-paced online. It's me teaching. You don't have to teach personal finance at all. I will teach those 20 lessons. Each lesson takes about an hour. And, you know, for example, let's take our lesson about cars. So I teach about cars, new versus used, what depreciation is, what leasing is. Um, and then, and, and it's great information, of course. But what really, really uh, helps is when I say, okay, now you've learned about a car. Now take your money in your budget, and they're doing a budget, an adult budget on Google Sheets. Take that money and, and now add a line for car. And if you have enough, you can pay cash. And if you don't, you have to have a loan. And that $20,000 car is going to cost you more like $24,000. You know, like, what? Mm -hmm. That's really okay. So. Mm -hmm. So that's it. It's 20 lessons. It takes each lesson takes about an hour. It's self-paced. It's much more fun if you do it uh, with siblings or a small group, because now all of a sudden, you know, now you're what car did you buy? What career do you have? Did you have to have a student loan? I'm broke. I, I have money. <laughs> you know, all of that. And I, I because life is not just linear. I also every single lesson, they spin a wheel. And the wheel determines something happened to them. Their baby pooped on the couch. They have to pay $350. Their car alternator breaks. Their whatever it is. And they're seeing every lesson. Mm. Uh-oh. Not only is the predictable happening and very expensive, but mm -hmm. now there's unpredictable. And, you know, they, they're watching that savings balance rise and fall through those 20 lessons. They get to the end. They are 42 years old. And I say, OK, let's talk about retirement. Let's talk about what Social Security is. Let's, you know, all the things, because, of course, we're calculating a paycheck and I'm showing them how to do taxes, not in depth, but you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Age appropriate, age appropriate. This is middle and high school level. Um and then I say, this is what, to be on track to retire, of course, you're not retiring at 42, but to be on track, you need about this much money. Mm -hmm. Now, everybody look down <laughs> at their budget and see, as 42-year-old you, did you make it? What choices did you make that allowed you to have the number that you, you should have? Or did you not make it? And if so, what caused you to be, to get off the course? Was it like in my case, because this whole time I am showing them my, um, my own budget for, for me going through the class and okay. I don't make it. I don't make that number. And the <laughs> biggest reason I don't make the number is because of my student loans in mm. those, like, you know, I needed student loans in my twenties, instead of spending that money. 
uh, or, or saving that money, I'm, sp I'm spending it on student loans so that I wasn't able to get that buildup of money over time. And now they're seeing, oh, wait a minute. Now I see what happened. And so it's for some, they've chosen a career that does not pay enough. And I, mm -hmm. I would love everybody to do the job that they want to do. I would love their hopes and dreams to come true. Unfortunately, that just our society does not pay for a lot of those hopes and dreams. Artists, very talented artists can be broke. And I, I hate it, but it's just true. I don't know mm -hmm. why we pay LeBron James and his skill of dunking a basketball way more than we, t than we pay an artist or a musician or a dancer, but mm -hmm. we do. And so I want our kids to see that you can still have hopes and dreams. You can still pursue those things in the nights and the weekends. But if you choose a career that doesn't line up with the life you want to have, then you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to say, say no to something. And it might be saying no to a house or saying no to, you know, uh, the house that you want or the car that you want or whatever it is. And I need them to see it on paper because a lot of times they just don't believe our words. And mm -hmm. I would, I would just rather, you know, I, I had a, a kid in, in my class. He couldn't decide between being a composer or an engineer. So I had him do the class in parallel because you can do, you know, multiple budgets. And he saw that for a composer, he couldn't pay the bills. Wow. And, but for an engineer, he had money left over. And so I, you know, I said, Hey, listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry that it's true, but it's true. And so <laughs> it is possible for you to compose on the nights and weekends. But if you try to be a composer, but you're so stressed out trying to pay those bills and there's tension in your life because you don't make enough, then it's going to sap your creative energy. And now all of a sudden you're composing to pay the bills instead of composing from a place in your heart. So mm. I would rather you pay those, get those bills paid, find a job, get paid. And then the nights and weekends, man, have a great time. And hopefully you can build up that hobby into a job. But if you start with the job, you may be behind the eight ball sooner than, than you would want. So well, that's what they learn in my class. And it's, yeah. it's just powerful to see. Yeah. I mean, to me, it sounds like you're giving guidance counseling along with teaching personal finance. And I love that. So I, I bet my listeners are loving it too. Tell them how they can find out more about your course and connect with you online. Yeah. So uh, at beyondpersonalfinance.com. Um, you can, there's my website. There'll be a pop-up that'll say, um, you know, follow me and you can add yourself to uh, once a week only. I send, um, advice, um, information, you know, like I have uh, a freebie that says, you know, five arguments not to have with your kids. Um, here's a way, here's my budget suggestions for getting your kids for school clothes, that kind of thing. Once a week, you can get that for free. It comes out on Wednesday mornings. And then while you're on the website, you can browse around and you can see there are two options. You can do the self-paced or you can do it like you can host a group for yourself. Mm -hmm. And there are two options. And if you want to host a group, there's a way to schedule a call directly with me and sort of talk through what that would look like and, you know, how it works in a group setting. So I think everything that you would need would be on beyondpersonalfinance.com and you'll be able to, to join in. And, and I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to have it. I always ask my listeners or my readers, you know, send in questions that you have, mm -hmm. you know, some of my great uh, writings have come directly from those questions. You know, what to do with generalist grandparents? You know, how do you, mm. if you've said no to something and your grand, the, then the grandma goes and buys the iPad, what do you do? Things like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I love it. I love to answer the questions. Well, that is 
a fantastic service that you are offering to people. I have really enjoyed our chat today. I kind of wish I had young kids that I could do even I more real life finance with, um, but I know that my listeners do have those kids. And so I know that this has been so, so helpful to them. Thank you for taking you the time to welcome. share with us. Yes, you are welcome. Well, thank you very much for having me. Bye everybody.